My name is Ilya Sayeg, Chair of the Sarasota County Bar Association's Council for Diversity and Inclusion. On behalf of the SCBA and the Council for Diversity and Inclusion, I welcome each of you to this important discussion, the impact of corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion on outside counsel. Our own Jay Castle will moderate our wonderful panel today. Tamara Williams and I will moderate the chat room for questions and we will give the questioners in the chat room an opportunity to present their questions to the panelists, uh, or Tamara or I can present the questions on their behalf. Thank you to the Community Foundation of Sarasota County for the sponsorship of this important discussion. Thanks to their support, each bar member attending this event is receiving a $10 gift card to Panera. And now let me introduce today's panel. Please welcome Jim Stewart, PhD. Dr. Stewart is a professor emeritus at Penn State University, where he was also the inaugural vice provost for education equity with responsibility for developing and implementing Penn State's diversity, equity, and inclusion policies and procedures. He has served as a consultant on DEI issues for several universities and the Department of Defense. Dr. Stewart has served as president of the National Economic Association president of the National Council for Black Studies and the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, ASALA. He is the past president of Minnesota ASALA and serves on the board of trustees of, of the new College of Florida, as well as several Sarasota area nonprofit organizations. We also have with us Connie Lindsay. Ms. Lindsay is exec executive vice president and head of corporate social responsibility for Northern Trust in Chicago, Illinois. She is responsible for the design and implementation of the Global Corporate Social Responsibility Community Development and Investments and Global Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Strategies for Northern Trust and the development of goals, policies and programs appropriate to the brand and business unit strategies. In addition, Ms. Lindsay provides oversight and leadership to the firm's response to environmental matters as well as social issues within the marketplace, workplace, and the community. Over the course of her Northern Trust career, Ms. Lindsay has held numerous leadership roles, including Deputy Business Head in Operations and Technology, Group Head in Northern Trust Wealth Management Business, Director of Enterprise Relationship Management, and Manager in Treasury Management Consulting and Product Management. Ms. Lindsay received her BA in finance at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and has completed the Harvard Business School Executive Education Corporate Social Responsibility Program. She is also a licensed qualified administrator of the Intercultural Development Inventory, and she holds the Certified Treasury Professional Designation. We're also joined by Carol Ann Kalish. Many of our Sarasota County Bar Association audience members know Carol Ann. Ms. Kalish is the Chief Legal Officer for the Sarasota County Public Hospital District, which owns and operates the Sarasota Memorial Healthcare System, the largest employer in Sarasota County. It is also among the largest public health systems in Florida, and it includes the 839-bed Sarasota Memorial Hospital and the soon-to-open 110-bed Sarasota Memorial Hospital Venice, which is right down the road from my house, as well as a multi-specialty physician practice group skilled nursing facility, behavioral health hospital, and a network of outpatient and urgent care centers. Board certified as a specialist in health law, Carol Lamb focuses on Florida and federal health laws relating to business and practice of medicine, including licensure, regulation, credentialing, HIPAA, and TALA compliance. She also advises the system in risk management, medical staff issues, and managed care policies. Prior to her service as Chief Legal Officer for SMH, she was a partner at Williams Parker here in Sarasota, where she concentrated her practice on health law. With that wonderful panel that we have, I will now turn over to our moderator, Jay Castle of Castle Health, P Castle Health Law PLLC and Level Mediation LLC. Jay is the Programs Chair for the Sarasota County Bar Association's Council for Diversity and Inclusion. Jay, take it from here. Thank you, Elias, and thank you to our panel for your service and for your expertise and your generosity in spending some time with us today. Um, let's get right to it, okay? Uh, Ms. Lindsay, let's start. Uh, 
can we level set with our audience? What are we talking about today? What is a diversity, equity, or initiative, an inclusion initiative? What are these things that we're going to talk about today? Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me. I'm pleased to be a part of the discussion. And I want to start with nomenclature. There's a difference between initiative and strategy. So the work that I've done for years and the work that I do at Northern Trust, we talk about strategy uh, versus initiative. So when I think of an initiative, that's like a first mover on something. We're, we're trying to have um, an activity that addresses it, whereas strategy suggests that we really are putting together a plan to solve a specific problem or an issue. So for us, it is about strategic imperatives for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I define that those terms in this way. I think this is memorable and tweetable. Diversity is being invited to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. But equity means I get to choose the music to which I dance. So hopefully what we'll, we're going to talk about today and share with one another, Jay, really is diversity, equity, and inclusion from my perspective as a strategic imperative. How do we use a quantitative and a qualitative approach to really see change, sustainable change, and where does the accountability lie in each of those areas? Understood, and you're right, that, that distinction might be subtle for some of our viewers, but um, I know it's important. Um, can you expand a little bit on, on the, why does it matter? Why do these words matter? The words matter so much because as we think about ways that we're going to address issues of, whether it's, um, biases in any way or any of the isms that we, we face. How do we attract talent? How do we retain talent? And even in terms of nonprofit boards, how do we relate to the communities that we say we're going to serve? So strategy is looking at it this way. For example, at Northern Trust, we had some hypotheses around why we weren't seeing levels of representation that we thought we should throughout the organization. So our approach was quantitative and qualitative. We looked at four years of data. Our hypothesis was that movement within the organization was directly correlated or in some way correlated to advancement, to experiences, which eventually could lead to promotion. And so what we did was we looked at 4,000 moves over four years to test the hypothesis that that was true. And what we found was that absolutely those individuals who were being moved into different roles at, at different times we're certainly having more lucrative career experiences, both in terms of the opportunities, the experiences that they got. But what we found was that most of those moves were going to, weren't going to women or people of color. And so then we said, how do we impact that? What levers can we pull to really affect that? We did qualitative work in talking to our partners around the globe, we call our employees partners. What was their lived experience at the firm? What were their views on how they felt they were being treated? And so what levers could we pull? And that moved us to looking at how we rate employees, how job postings were handled. All of those things, Jay, became the tactics. And if you want to call them initiatives, but the broader strategy, increased inclusion. Because our research showed us that it was, in this case, Blacks, Hispanics in the US and women globally were not having a similar experience, certainly to white males, but overall. All right, um, Dr. Stewart, kind of following up a little bit and maybe giving a little bit more historical and economic analysis behind what Ms. Lindsay just said, you know, what are some of the drivers behind strategies to try to, to move the needle for diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, if we, if we go back in time, I think two of the principal drivers were the issue of underrepresentation of various population groups, including people of color and women in, in many cases, as well as uh, a, a historical record of discrimination that was faced by those groups. So, so the initial public policies that were developed to address those issues involved passing anti-discrimination legislation, as well as in the case of trying to uh, uh, recognize the fact that there were continuing barriers for upward mobility we created affirmative action programs. And of course there was a, a, a significant uh, effort put forth in terms of developing policies and procedures to implement affirmative action. Uh, I think it became apparent uh, as we moved through time that there were issues with affirmative action that required that we look at different approaches to addressing these issues and diversity, equity, and inclusion has emerged as that strategy uh, one of the differences between diversity and affirmative action is that 
diversity initiatives have recognized that everybody's background and experience provides opportunities for us to, to benefit. Whereas in many cases, affirmative action uh, uh, focused its efforts around comparing the experiences of people of color and women with those of white males. And of course that created a backlash to some extent and diversity has attempted to try to rec recognize the fact that all of us have a role to play in organizations. Okay, um, so in addition to sort of the social justice kind of components to some of these strategies and efforts, is there a, is there a business case to be made for organizations to employ a, a, a DEI strategy? Uh, certainly, I, uh, myself and a colleague wrote a paper about the rate of return on investment in DEI issues. And what we found in our research was that when you have a diverse group of individuals who are making decisions, you have a greater likelihood of coming up with, a, you could call it a profit maximizing or an optimizing decision, as opposed to those where you have people who only come from one particular background or have one particular perspective on a subject matter. Um, uh, and so, and we found that across different industries, but, but I think you see it uh, increasingly in, in, even in places like the military. That you, that you see it as, as we've incorporated more women into leadership roles, you get a different perspective in terms of how do you negotiate situations where you may uh, allow you not to have to use military force in order to uh, achieve an, the desired outcome. Right. Um, so for, for, the, for all the panelists, um, are there unique attributes for any particular organization because we, we quickly move from the macro to more of a, you know, tailored kind of focus when we get to a specific organization. You know, are there any attributes like its history or its geography or its particular industry or, you know, customer base, all those different factors that sort of go into defining any one organization. Do those matter when it comes to what might be the appropriate strategy for that particular organization? I would say absolutely, uh, Jay, without question. For example, in our business, you know, one of the things that we talk to our clients about is portfolio diversification. We would never advise a client to have a single stock in their investment portfolio. So diversification matters in financial um, portfolio construction and it matters in business. Thinking about the culture of an organization. What, how are things getting done? What, what is required of that? And so when I think about those important aspects of what's unique to business, we look at wealth transfer and what's going to happen in this country over the coming years. Who do I want to invest my money with? And I'm speaking from you know, what I know, which is you know, the, the wealth management business and so on. They don't want to, you know, most of our, our younger investors, they have a different view, whether it's using technology more, they're not looking for bricks and mortar, it's, it's clicks. How do, they, how do they do that? So adapting our business so that we are nimble and flexible enough to address those emerging needs and then hiring and training and retaining the talent that is representative of that, that's where the opportunity lies. We know that uh, intergenerationally in organizations like ours, there are five or six generations at work. So how do we leverage all of that talent? And then certainly uh, the great resignation as some uh, people are referring to it now, it's how are we gonna keep that talent that we already have? Inclusion is it, you know, and, and I'll close with this, you know, diversity exists. Um, just as um, the professor said, it's that diversity is what it is, but the inclusion is the action around that. And then we have to have equity to make sure that it's actualized and realized. Okay, so, so, so Car I was gonna say, Carol Ann, I mean, you know, we heard a bit about financial services. How about healthcare? And how about Sarasota Memorial, especially? Yeah, so um, I, I'm, I'm just completely able to draw parallels here with, you know, our stock and trade is the health and wellness of the citizens of our community. One of the things that we know for sure is that uh, there is varying access to care depending on your zip code, depending on, in some cases, your color. Um, members of the LGBTQIA community are generally have, as a demographic, have uh, less access to appropriate care. Our job as the public health care system is to care for all members of our community. And we know that when we have a diverse workforce, that when the folks who are at the bedside caring for people and the, the folks who are making strategic decisions on behalf of the organization, when that best reflects the community, we can best mirror back that care to the community. So that 
has financial dividends, of course, to the community and the health, um, the health of the, the community is its greatest asset. It also delivers to our margin. So we know that when we can deliver on our mission, we can make greater investments in areas that are either not as profitable or have been historically underserved. So we see a, a direct correlation between our workforce looking like the community that it serves, um, enhancing areas that have had historic uh, underrepresentation. We see a direct correlation between our financial health, the health of our community, and our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And, and Dr. Stewart, some of the other folks that you've consulted with besides Penn State, I mean, I know you've got a background with the Defense Department, but some other educational institutions, same kind of comments or something slightly different or how about that? Well, one of the things that we've tried to do in higher education is to focus on, I think again, on Ms. Lindsay's comments about being very strategic. So a lot of institutions now have focused on developing equity and inclusion, diversity, equity and inclusion plans that try to encompass all of the activities of the university. And because the structure of universities is such that uh, you have a, very, a lot of different types of stakeholders. So you have your student stakeholders, you have the student parents, you've got the faculty, the staff, and, and each of those constituencies has very different interests and perspectives that has to be uh, accommodated in a, a strategic approach. Right. So, so really, it's as I think what I'm hearing is it's as much about taking those perspectives into consideration as it is about the actual carriers of those perspectives. I mean, is that a fair sort of statement on why this becomes important for businesses? Well, I, I think it's, it's both taking the perspectives into account, but also recognizing that there's a need to develop a cultural knowledge that, that goes beyond the, uh, what we, we typically might experience. If, you, if, you're, if your business is focused primarily on domestic issues, you have one set of skills that you need to develop. But if you're in a global context, you, that, that sort of magnifies the need for uh, understanding and broadening uh, our perspectives and recognizing the biases that we bring to the, the, that uh, type of situation. Right. If Absolutely. I could add that to, to Dr. Stewart, that's so true. We're a global company and we talk about cross-cultural competence. I know you, you teach that and talk as well because talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion to our employees in North America is very different in many ways than talking to, let's say, our, our employees in India. Words uh, have different meaning, experiences are different. So it is really important that as we have leaders in those areas that we are clear about what the cultural implications are as well. Otherwise, it is not as effective and we're, we're leaving people out of the discourse. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Well, let's 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 go into a little bit of that. Let's talk a little bit about how some of these strategies and these programs, these initiatives, are structured. Um, first off, you know, and and then, and then, you know, these are as as I've learned from you all, these are very carefully designed um, ideas, and invariably the structure will have some desired effect or impact on what you're trying to achieve. Right. So, so let's talk first a little about what what I I think folks call internal um, strategies, internal initiatives. In other words, these are sort of inward looking within the organization. What are what are some examples of those kinds of inward facing um, initiatives? And, and and what are organizations focusing on? You know, what are they trying to accomplish when they when they deploy these kinds of things? I can tell you at Sarasota Memorial, and it's probably helpful because we are such a large employer here, we have internally a, a diversity council. I advise them. I am not the face of the diversity council because they do reflect the full diversity of our organization. Their job is to create programs, um, at both educational and outreach programs, um, internal educational and outreach programs to enhance opportunities to grow our diversity, equity, and inclusion. They're across the, we're kind of a little village. We have doctors, we have executives, we have um, advanced practice professionals. We have folks who are chefs, people who help us keep the building running. We have a, a, a kind of a, a cross-cultural, cross-trained, um, cross-section of the community. And our diversity council 
operates internally to make sure that we remain aware of what the diversity of our community is, what the diversity of the patients who we serve are, and how we can best make sure that we are conscientious of the ways that our biases might be informing decisions that we're making um, and bring everyone together. I love, um, um, Ms. Lindsay, I love your analysis with regard to who plays the music because I think that that is such an especially good way of understanding that it's, it's not just hearing a perspective or um, inviting people to the table. It's saying, how, how are you going to set this table? What, what is the atmosphere in the, the room going to be? How are we going to incorporate that? And I think that's what our internal diversity, equity, and inclusion council does. Jay, I would say from my corporate perspective, I report to our CEO. And so as we started the conversation and talking about initiative versus strategy, and in our world, it matters who and where the power is relative to this. We have business resource councils, or some people call them ERGs. Those are the initiatives and activities. You know, you can have a food celebrated every month or whatever. That is not going to move the needle. So there has to be external and internal pressure. So strategically for us, I'm not an HR person. I have a finance background. So I came to the role that I have today with that business client community perspective, understanding we're a for-profit organization. So for us, that messaging comes from the CEO and I and the, the people who report to him. So the three outcomes from our strategy, accountability. What are we going to get done? How will we measure what gets done? And what are the consequences if it is not done? Number two, expanding training and development. What are the skills that we say we think people need? One of my least favorite words that I hear people say is someone is not a fit. And what does that mean? When people say, when, how can I be promoted? You're not ready now. Well, what does not ready now mean? And then thirdly, it's culture. I think there's a, I'll paraphrase you know, this quote that says, uh, culture eats change for lunch. What is it in our culture that precludes people from having an experience that allows them to maximize their gifts and talents? So it has to start from the top. And yes, the initiatives might be executed through the BRCs or business resource councils or ERGs, but who are those leaders? Who is in that frozen middle that cannot become comfortable with seeing someone in that role that they've never seen before? To see a portfolio manager, for example, who is not a white male, but is a woman of color or a transgender person, whatever that might be, how do you get through those cultural issues? And what are the systems and structures that we need to disrupt, quite frankly, in order to make that kind of seismographic change that is sustainable and in yours? And finally, I'll say, in my role as head of corporate responsibility, ESG or environmental, social and governance investing requires levels of transparency that we've not heretofore seen. So investors are saying, what's the diversity of your board of directors? Are you investing in um, the kinds of things that won't damage, uh, that don't um, increase climate change? So it isn't just this insular, let's have an activity and hope we feel better because that's the illusion of inclusion. And it really builds monuments to nothingness other than frustrated people. And so the internal and external pressure that really can, as um, Dr. Stewart said, it does come down to you know, the profit of corporations. And we're hearing that more and more and in producing the kinds of reports, looking at stock valuation and so on. So, so it's that kind of, you know, I get real passionate about it because I've seen it done numerous ways. And the only way to make it happen is people, A, have to have you know, understanding that there are outcomes to this, that you're accountable for it. And you really, it's more than just, it's the right thing to do. There's the moral case for diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, which ties into the business case. So it can affect all things, brand and everything else. It, it strikes me that um, metrics rear their ugly head and most lawyers run away very fast from numbers, but um, metrics really do play a part here, right? Because I mean, how do you know what you're changing if you don't know how to measure it? So, so talk a little bit about some of the measures that you all look at when you're trying to define success with these strategies. And as I said, we did a quantitative, we look at it quantitatively and qualitatively because we can get married to metrics and I'm a numbers person. I you know, have a wonderful relationship with numbers, but we can also use numbers as an excuse. And that excuse usually manifests, Dr. Stewart, jump on in here, is we can't find any, right? We have a certain position. And so that's how we can use, people can use metrics to really hide behind this lack of initiative or effort or responsibility. But for us, each of our business unit leaders has a, uh, what we call a scorecard. And so they know how many people are in their business. We've developed some modeling that allows them uh, for opportunities that are open in their, how many people are available for that? What are we looking at? So, you know, first of all, what's your population and the representation of that? What are the opportunities? And then how do we create ways to have 
good diversity on the um, slates of individuals who are applying for that. And we review that on a quarterly basis, our CEO and I co-chair and executive council, and we literally walk through, what are the challenges that you have? So it isn't shame and blame, it's how can we help you be more effective in this? Now we do identify those who might be a little resistant and that's okay, um, but we're gonna make sure that we are able to measure, quantify, give you what you need to help get you there and then um, move on from that. I think a, a, having a scorecard is very, very important. And it's also important to have consequences associated with not meeting the objectives. Those can be tied to compensation uh, or in terms of, of resources that are devoted to, to, to the unit. Uh, and, and it becomes very clear that if you, and I think what Ms. Lindsay pointed to is that she reports directly to the CEO. If you don't have that leadership from the top that's driving down to the other levels, then you're really uh, putting yourself in, in a situation where, you, where you're going to fail. Uh, when I was the uh, in my role, I did not report directly to the president of the university. I reported to another person, so it was very difficult to get the message to to, to the president in ways that allowed him to put pressure on on the other units. So it was. Uh, fortunately, that, fortunately, that person that I reported to eventually got moved out and we had a much more successful posture, but it's very critical that you have to, to put, have someone at the very top that's driving this initiative. The other thing that we, tended to, that we did was to put somebody in place in each of our academic colleges, and there were 10 colleges that was responsible for working with the leadership in those units to be able to make sure that they had the resources that they needed to be able to implement the strategy effectively. One other thing I'd add, Jade, too, is, you know, our board of directors, we're a publicly traded company. So to your point, Dr. Stewart, in, in Carol Ann, our strategy was presented to the board of directors of our firm. So they, too, were engaged. So when you think about DEI governance, it doesn't just reside in HR. It is the board of directors now who know what that strategy is. And so then they what? They help hold the, the uh, CEO and other leaders of the firm accountable as well. If I could comment for a minute on, um, so we have the internal um, work in place to try to make sure that our workforce reflects our patients and our community. I'm also a consumer of legal services because as the chief legal officer, it's my job to um, engage outside counsel on issues that I can't handle inter internally. I have a kind of a small staff, so I do use a lot of outside counsel. Some of the folks that I, um, that I work with are on this call and they've gotten the calls from me. Um, there's a very, very talented attorney who was the chief legal officer at Brigham and Women's in Boston. His name is Brent Henry. He's amazing. And when I first came in house at, at Sarasota Memorial, I happened to listen to him talk about the role of the chief legal officer. And one of the things that he told me that I found so compelling was use your power to make the change in the world. And it, it had not occurred to me because I had been outside counsel that in my purchasing power, I had the opportunity to call upon folks who reflected what our organizational ethics were and what our organizational commitment to DE&I was. And so when I am talking to outside firms, I ask them to provide me a copy of their DE&I policies or to point me to where on their website their um, DE&I statements live. And... Um, have conversations about their commitment to inclusion in their workforces. And I'm sure for folks on the phone, that probably um, is, is maybe something you haven't thought about. But as, as people who are selling legal services, I think it's really important when you're dealing with inside counsel to understand not just what you can provide to them in terms of your incredibly good skill as a, a lawyer, but how you can advance their mission by matching your ethos to what the organizational ethos is on these really critical issues like DE&I. Well, a nice segue um, because we kind of move from the internal sort of inward facing initiatives to what I would call external facing sort of vendor relations kinds of issues, other outside constituent relations um, initiatives. You've given an example, Carol Ann, um, what are some other examples of how organizations um, try to encourage their, their vendors, which include outside counsel, um, to better reflect their ethos? So I think, you know, we think of it in terms of supply chain management, and that can include 
um, the people who supply physical products, but, but also um, investments. So we want to ensure that we have diverse investment advisors and managers, and that we then as a firm are also making investments and doing business with those diverse firms. We think about you know, wealth creation. What does that look like in our communities from a Northern Trust perspective? In our community investment group, we have over a billion dollars that cover things like wealth creation, affordable housing, using different investment strategies, social innovation bonds that help us to ameliorate some of the societal issues, whether it's recidivism or um, affordable housing. So within that, we look at, for example, and Caroline used the um, example of, of, of our legal firms, external firms. We're looking at those organizations to certainly determine how they are leveraging the diversity within their organizations. And we do say uh, we need to show evidence of that. And we, we did a uh, some strategic work and did a survey with several of our um, outside providers or, or business vendors to look at the diversity, have them respond to a survey. So they understand that we are looking at this, it makes a difference, and that we will make decisions accordingly based on their ability to, to show um, inclusion and how that works in their organizations. And, and as I said before, our key stakeholders, whether it's shareholders, community groups, or whatever, they care about that as well. And we have to show evidence and have proof of that, not just um, whether it's just the performative allyship that I often see, we'll say all the words, but people aren't doing anything. But if we're talking about we're allies with certain communities, we have the proof of that, there's evidence of it. And then how do the numbers look for us in what we're doing? How are we working with minority brokers and so on? Let, let me give you an example of what happens when you don't have, when you don't have that, that level of scrutiny. Uh, Penn State, where I, where I work, using outside counsel, and during that period of time, there was a lot of, of concern about LGBTQ rights. And so we, we got into a, 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 a very, very difficult discussion about how do you, what, what, are, what levels of protection do you provide for that community? And how do you include them? Um, our outside counsel, let's just say, was, was not progressive. And he advised the institution to take a hard line against these particular uh, approaches. And what wound up that I that he and I had to go to NIH in Washington D.C. to resolve the issue, and and let's just say he got a lesson in terms of what DEI actually, actually means. So you really do have to make sure that when you're looking at outside counsel or any other outside supplier, that they really do understand these issues and they are in alignment with your organization's goals and values. So important, Dr. Stewart, because we do depend on our legal partners to help guide us through this, right? Um, because one can go in one direction and then it becomes exclusive to another group. And that's an issue as well. So mitigating the risks, for example, if you're talking about having diverse slates, um, it is legal to have diverse slates or what some refer to as the Rooney rule, but you can't exclude uh, a total group because of that, right? And that's the attorneys have trained me on that really well. And so it is important as you as you talked about, Dr. Stewart, if you're going to engage a law firm or something that they understand the nuances of these issues. Um, we, you know, for, for our firm, for example, we have to comply with um, EEOC and produce a report. It's really important to understand that from a legal perspective. And then finally, I'd say um, also internally, as we work through things like identification, um, there, you know, in certain parts of the world, you know, you're not going to be able to self-identify perhaps as you might in other areas. Do the HR systems that you utilize allow employees to identify whether it's racially, ethnically, or LGBTQ or any of those things and how important that is for individuals in those organizations to be able to, uh, to identify themselves that allows them the level of comfort to know that they matter. And then quite frankly, if we're going to hold people accountable, we really need the data, right? So that we know, you know, how people identify in all those ways. Right. So, so there are a number of our listeners, I think, myself included, who would be interested in trying to align our firms better or more closely with what you're saying. But sometimes I think people struggle to just take the first step of, you know, sort of where do I begin? So do you have any advice for folks who might be in that position of what they might do to better align their themselves as well as their firms with what you are looking for from an outside law firm? I'm sure Dr. Stewart has a view here as well. But I think first and foremost, it is looking internally. 
that self-assessment that you're doing, you look at your own team and how inclusive is your own team. Secondly, how informed you are about the issues that relate to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, not representation is important, but the way different laws globally might affect that. And what I look at is, you know, when, when you come and have a conversation, you know, how comfortable are those individuals? Are they just coming at it from a first do no harm, which we know that is true, but it isn't just you keeping me out of legal trouble. A real effective DEI strategy means we see the, the opportunity to grow business, to have our firm become a place where people want to work. So I do want you to keep us out of trouble legally. But I also want to believe and have you demonstrate to me, A, you understand the issues, the risks, the challenges, but also the opportunities that come from having an inclusive workforce where you're leveraging diversity, thinking about the products, the way you represent your brand, all of those ways to determine the effectiveness of it. And that, that's one of the ways, or several of the ways I think that law firms can really support and be of use. Um, I, I think that it's important to look at best practices. So if you can identify an organization that's doing a, a good job in this area to get information and adapt those uh, practices to, to your organization, that's one, one strategy. I think another is to, if you have been successful in developing a diverse uh, a workforce to utilize the affinity groups that that exist in many organizations as a resource to try to help uh, to educate the entire organization. Uh, I mean, uh, my, my uh, one 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 of my, one of my daughters is a lawyer and she's part of African American affinity group and they've been very successful in 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 staging events as well as informational uh, sessions that are are open to all of the members of of, of the firm. And just as, as, a, as a member of our local community, I know that it has often been said, and many of you know, Sarasota is one of the least diverse communities in the entire nation, surprisingly so. Um, I'm kind of hoping that the data that comes out from the most recent census will, will show that we've moved the needle a little bit, and, and hopefully Sarasota Memorial has been part of moving that needle. I want to give credit to the Sarasota County Bar Association for having um, an awareness of diversity and equity and inclusion and having scholarships for law students that are related to that, that make um, give folks an opportunity to grow up in the Sarasota legal community, starting at kind of that baby stage as a baby lawyer and see themselves and envision themselves as part of the Sarasota community. I would encourage the Bar Association to advance that. Um, I know that I'm not the only organization in town who has the opportunity to provide internships for legal students. Um, and I, I love to be able to do that. I don't have it in my budget. And so the Bar Association has sponsored um, those, uh, their educational requirements and don't, don't get me started on internships as an educational requirement and how inequitable that can be. But I'm happy to try to provide support that and an opportunity for folks to see what um, a diverse employer in Sarasota looks like, what the community looks like from inside the C-suite. Um, and I think that that's probably a way that that a bar association can help grow an entire DEI atmosphere within a community is to to really work to grow the folks that you want to attract. Uh, we have um, many of you know a, a GME program, a graduate medical education program. Um, the clinic that they operate out of, we chose to locate in a historically underserved area of Sarasota to grow doctors and, and access to healthcare in that community. And the person who runs that program works really hard to recruit non-traditional medical students and those who have shown a commitment to DE and I initiatives in their uh, medical school training before they come out into their residency program. So I think that um, kind of to borrow the expression, just to, to be the change that you want to see in the world, to, to grow folks into your community and welcome folks into your community and give them opportunity and uh, hope for their place. I, I think that hopefully we've, we're doing that. I like to think that I'm doing that. And, and I think that for other members of the Bar Association, you guys have shown a, a commitment to that through the diversity um, committee, but I would invite a, even greater um, expansion of that. One of the common um, statements you sometimes hear from firms who are interested in doing these things um, and they're stuck is, I can't find the people. What do you all have to say about that? I 
I think there are a lot of really talented people out there if you just go and look in the right places. Uh, I used to work on recruitment at my old firm, and I think we our on-campus interviewing was limited to a, a very small number of law schools. Um, and I, I know that that has expanded in, in recent years, but I would say, and obviously I'm, I'm from a small town and a very non-diverse town, but I think that um, talent is, is where you look for it. I always say talent is ubiquitous, opportunity is not. Carol Ann, I love the way you talked about what you were describing is pipeline. And so how do people get into the pipeline? How do we recruit? Typically, folks recruit or, or talk to people that they know, people who are most like themselves. And so what is required if we're going to even embark on a, on, on a journey of learning to be more inclusive? It requires us, A, to have empathy, to be able to understand someone's story without judgment. B, intellectual curiosity. Are we asking the right questions? And I believe a more beautiful question always gets you to a more beautiful answer. But thirdly, Jay, when I hear people say, I can't find one, I, my own practice as a professional and an executive, is that I have a pipeline. I have people that I know and talk to, and I go out of my way to make sure that I know where other talent is within our organization. We're looking at that pipeline all the time, but I would go back to what are the things that are precluding people from even being identified? How do we talk about talent within the organization? If I'm describing an African-American woman, what words am I using to describe her talent juxtaposed a white male? Are we looking at only certain schools, and I know how important education is, and it doesn't mean in any way the soft bigotry of low expectations of saying, you know, if I introduce diversity, how will that lower the talent pool? But it really requires that. First of all, the acknowledgement that, you know, we, can, we need to look in different places. Uh, Carol Ann, I love the idea of, you know, how, we can't be what we can't see. So how do we start initiatives or programs early on in the process that help young people in communities that may not be in the ones, the ones like we live in today, that know that it is possible to do that. It is possible to see, you know, people in various roles and they can do that. And then for us as leaders to make that happen, for us to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and asking those questions. Why are there no women or people of color or people uh, with disabilities or military experience, whatever that might be, but it requires an uncommon level of courage and for us to become uncomfortable doing that. And so Jay, when, whenever uh, people say they can't find, I say you're looking either through the wrong lenses or in the wrong places. And then I come forward with a way to help you think differently about that. I also think there's a bias in, in a number of organizations regarding where you get your your training, so there's also if you as example if you if you come out of an Ivy League school you assume that that you you're, you're qualified that you that, that you that you're the the best candidate for a position and that's not necessarily the case it has to be a match between what the expectations of the employer are and the training of the individual. You know, in 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 my, in my industry higher education. Um, we're a public institution, so our, we're committed to educating the sons and daughters of the working or, or the working class. And if you've gone to an Ivy League school, you may not have had the opportunity to have training to prepare you to work effectively with those. So you may not necessarily be the right candidate to for for, for a position. And, and I think that cuts across other types of organizations as well. I love that, Dr. Stewart. You know, resilience. We talk a lot about as leaders how important it is to be resilient. Oftentimes, individuals who have gone through the most diverse, uh, difficult circumstances um, and get education are more resilient because the expectation is that you work through issues. You have the kind of um, ability to look at difficulty and, and rebound and do that sort of thing. So that resilience, you're right, Dr. Stewart, as we look at different places from which people come and how they're able to navigate challenge and difficulty. Right. I mean, that you, you just identified something that I've never seen on any employer checklist I've ever seen, right? Resilience. I mean, there's no box to, to, to sort of interview someone about that issue that I've personally ever seen. So I think all of this is, to me, it kind of takes us full circle back to sort of where we started, right? Which is the, you know, understanding your organization and your customer base and your investor base, all of the things that drive the business, how do they relate to this effort, you know, going forward? I mean, are you right finding the right candidate? Or are you just defaulting to what you have been told is the right candidate or the right pedigree? Um, so, so as a practical matter, 
Um, and Carolyn, maybe you can talk to this within the, the community and within the state. I mean, what are some um, what are some opportunities for folks to kind of break out of the same old, same old um, to try to expand their, their pipeline? I would say, based on what I know still about the legal recruiting world, is to look for folks that are um, outside of the normal on-campus recruiting patterns. And that doesn't always just mean expand to UVA or Vandy. It, it means maybe some of the more freshly licensed or, or accredited law schools. Um, look for folks who have sought out opportunities that match your mission. So, I, I, and again, I don't want to get sidetracked by this new and burgeoning apparent requirement in law school to do an unpaid internship as part of your education. But I will also say that for schools that have those, look for the student at develop relationships at those law schools with folks who have helped guide um, maybe students that didn't have a friend of a friend or a relative that gave them sort of that automatic entree to an internship. Um, Keith DeBose introduced me to one of his relatives who's helped us try to identify sort of non-traditional law students who are seeking internships. And, and we've had a couple of those folks, um, especially during the pandemic, because a lot of programs were shutting down their internship. Um, we've found a great pipeline with a, a more recently um, accredited law school with a higher degree of non-traditional students, and, and we've invited them into our community to teach them. My goal is always to show people what legal advice from the outside looks like once it gets into the, the C-suite and into the legal services department and gets operationalized and kind of uh, sensitizes folks to that, but I also love giving folks the opportunity to see what practicing law or working in a business environment looks like, because for many of these folks, um, it's their folks who have worked in healthcare and don't have that office um, experience. And, and so that's my little piece of that world, but I think that that translates across industries is seek out those contacts that you know will give you access to folks that you don't already have. Um, again, I'm so lucky because we have Keith DeBose, whose sister-in-law or cousin-in-law is, is part of a, a law school program, and that was so easy and so great for me. But everyone knows someone like that. And um, everyone knows someone, I mean, everyone on this call knows Keith DeBose, and they can call his sister-in-law or cousin-in-law. But um, I, I think that really exploiting the non-traditional resources in strategic ways that give you access to talent that you wouldn't find by turning over those same rocks. You're going to get great talent by like, you know, I got recruited by my former law firm because they went the traditional route and, and thank heavens for that. But um, I think really looking for the non-traditional route is a way to actualize that vision. I think it, uh, it would be useful to think about developing mentorship programs with undergraduate uh, pre-law programs so that uh, you get an early students get an early idea exactly what uh, the legal profession, uh, it, the, the range of opportunities that are associated with it. But you are, but mentorship is absolutely critical for success in many, many uh, di 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 different ways. And I think the earlier that those type of of connections can be built, it'll facilitate the, you know, the pipeline that moves into law school and then subsequently into various positions within the legal profession. We've got a few more minutes left. I wanted to touch a little bit about the unique aspects of each of your respective organizations or your experiences where they're, they're cause all of these strategies and programs all have they're not all one size fits all. Um, they're they're usually uniquely tailored. So so what are kind of some of the unique elements of of, of the things that you all have been doing in your um, work? I'll start. I think as I said before, one is it it really does matter the governance how the uh, DEI work is governed within an organization. Is it at the right level where there is accountability, where there are resources? 
such that if we do identify a need or an investment that needs to be made, for example, hiring diversity recruiters, individuals who are specifically trained and held accountable for ensuring that diversity comes into the organization, training our talent acquisition team so that they are best able to ask questions and have interviews that can mitigate as much bias as possible. So how do we change? This is a culture changing part of it. What are our behaviors? Looking at our own internal system. So you know, where is it situated? What is the governance? How are we finding out where those gaps are? For example, where are isms hidden within the organization? Even socially, and certainly in this time of the pandemic and working remotely, how are we ensuring that any initiatives that are a part of our strategy are happening? How are we continuing to engage with a newer members to our workforce so that they understand how important they are for retention? And finally, I'd have to say, you know, the how to anything is honesty, openness, and willingness. How are you gonna get there? You have to honestly say, this is something that we care about and we want to change and here are the outcomes and the benefits that inure to our key stakeholders. Um, the openness, the discomfort that comes with any kind of change. And so how do we then move forward with that? And being willing to it, you know, when intention captures your attention, Jay, that is where the outcomes happen. And finally, is it sustainable? Because I've been doing this work for a little bit now and actually avoided it for a long time in my career. Like I said, my background is finance. I have a love affair with numbers. Um, and so the whole point was, how do we really take all of that and translate it into a way that it isn't just the role of the DEI person or the HR person, that it is a part of how this business gets run? I think what, what we did when we started out, um, I was involved with the strategic planning process for the institution as a whole. And each unit was required to develop its own in, uh, plan. And what we found out was that DEI issues were marginalized and often not even discussed. So what we had to do was to implement a diversity st uh, strategic planning process that paralleled the overall strategic planning process to force institutions to recognize that there were complementarities and opportunities there. But over time, what we've been able to do is to integrate the two so that now strategic planning encompasses this in the same way that Ms. Lindsay is talking about, that it's recognized that it's an integral part of what we do and what we want to become. Is that, is that I mean, so let's talk a little bit about where this is moving, right? Because I think we've talked about sort of historical perspectives and kind of where we are today. And I think that's a nice sort of segue into what I think is happening. Um, is, is there not a convergence of the sort of separateness of DEI kind of work and the, the, the real work, if you would, but the, the business of the organization, is there not a convergence of those two things so that at some point we see that that's, that, that DEI lens, that focus is just embedded within the underlying business processes? I mean, is that a fair statement of where we think we're heading? Or, and if so, what are the obstacles to sort of realizing that? Mm -hmm. I hope that's where we're heading. I would love that. I think that um, the greater the DEI, the, the greater the benefit to society as a whole. And as someone who's in the business of people being well and happy, um, that's better for us as an organization if our community is more diverse. I, I think that there's a, a great deal of um, criticism of the fire hose of information that is out there. But I, in, from my perspective, I believe that it is much, much harder for people to hide their implicit biases. I think that the wealth of information about the actions that people take and the scrutiny that happens in the public square now, because the public square is ubiquitous, I think that that is gonna push these issues to be, I mean, I, two years ago, I had never heard of ESNG. You know, we're a public company, so we're not publicly traded, we're a governmental entity. Um, but now we have people asking us about, even though we don't, aren't required to have ESNG metrics because we don't do any kind of financing or, or stock trading or anything like that. Um, we have people ask us about it all the time. And I think that that is a reflection of, um, an increasing voice of younger generations who really are looking at the people that they interact with in the world in general as being a more integrated and more open place. And I don't, you know, the, the 
backroom discussions, the, the sotto voce comments that might have gone unexplored or unheard before. I don't think that happens anymore. And so greater transparency, I think, necessarily leads to having these indirect financial issues become directly relevant to the business of being a person in America. I think there is a convergence, and Caroline, as you talked about ESG and why that's important, we have ESG strategies in our firm, but it's very, very difficult, Jay. I don't think that there is any assumption that we're on a glide path to where all of this is going to work out fine. I think if we look at where our country is today, there is tremendous backlash. There is tremendous confusion, and so I think the work has to continue. We have to be candid and honest about that. But for those of us, I, I use the term with my team that we're really Jedi's, J-E-D-I. We are Jedi warriors for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so that's our approach to that. Um, but it really is equally as challenging today. I think there is a convergence. And you're right, Caroline, what's driving that certainly is ESG from an investment perspective and what that means. There is, you know, there are environmental issues that inure to people in communities that are hurt more by that. And then the health consequences that manifest as a result of that social issues. That's the inclusion that we're talking about today. And then the transparency that needs to happen, which comes to that G, governance. How are organizations managing themselves? Can you see uh, their commitment to DEI, not just in window dressing or the Noah's Ark version of DEI, as I refer to it, two of these, two of these, but is it really a part of their strategy? So, you know, we're all in this together in terms of moving that forward, you know, and I commend those who are participating with us today and listening and observing because it is the work. You know, we become comfortable with being uncomfortable. We hold ourselves accountable, but there's also just the moral decency of it all that I'm worth more than the value of what I can produce. And so therefore to measure me just based on what you see as the physical manifestations of whom I am as a human, human is wrong. And that's the part of the work that I think really gets to the heart of how we make that kind of change. I, th I think there's no question that there's going to be pushback. And I think all those of us who are committed and understand the values and benefits associated with DEI simply have to stay the course and try to communicate and help people to un understand. You know, I I've served as expert expert witness in several discrimination cases that involve uh, you know, harassment in the workplace. And, and given the current political climate, those things are, li are likely to, to increase, but we simply have to face them up, face them head on and, and try to move forward. Okay, um, I think we've got a couple audience questions now, if we could go over to that, Ilias. Sure, we've got Alan Perez. Alan, I'm spotlighting your camera, here you go. Thanks, Ilias, and uh, Miss Lindsay, I'll be, I'll be frank with you. I, um, at our next CDI meeting, I'm gonna be moving to change our name to the Jedi Council, <laughs> this is so cool. Um, <laughs> but I was wondering, uh, I was was wondering, would you, um, any one of you, first of all, thank you for spending your time with us today. Um, would any one of you be able to share a failure, something, you know, an, an event where um, you were you were trying to implement a, a DEI principle or a policy or just having a conversation and were met with a failure? And, and how did you navigate that? How did you work through that um, to, to help to grow and, and also maybe even help someone else grow. Well, I, I mentioned earlier the, the conflict that I had with external counsel regarding the LGBTQ question. Um, and again, in that situation, the both the president and the and the second in command were supporting the external counsel's interpretation of. So what I had to do was to convince them that we needed to go to Washington, D.C. to uh, resolve the issue. And when the issue got resolved in my favor, then that created a sort of a mini cultural climate change in, in terms of helping them to understand that they needed to develop a better understanding of DEI issues and to appreciate some of the expertise that some of us were bringing to the table. I think for me, I've, you know, in the work we've had several of our managers, you know, people talk about the frozen middle of the individuals who the people at the top who are saying thou shall, uh, thou shalt. And then you've got the people in the middle who actually execute a particular um, group where the manager, um, Dr. Stewart, as you said, was just resistant. I mean, just had this view of if everybody just worked hard, we'd all be great. So just work harder at being great. And the person was just not going to 
uh, be moved from, from their position in terms of their views. And so through the accountability, the data and the metrics, we move them along. I often say we, we help them find their destiny elsewhere because sometimes people are just not gonna change. And if we're true to this, we have to then make examples of, of individuals or show that uh, we're really serious about inclusion. I think I'd like to ask one one uh, question. Um, well, I just uh, took everybody off here. Excuse me for one minute. Let me undo that. So my question, um, when we're talking about, um, Dr. Stewart, you mentioned consequences. Um, and excuse me while I try to fix the, the spotlight. You, you had mentioned consequences. Uh, and and Carol Ann, you mentioned these discussions that you have with outside counsel if their ethos matches uh, yours. Um, what are consequences of when the outside counsel's ethos does not match? Do you go find other outside counsel? Uh, do you uh, do the legal fees get impacted? And instead of just the the sort of negative consequences, um, when their ethos matches is one of the things. For example, that brand appearing in court, there's a jury, and that jury appears. Uh, or, or the, the lawyers appear in front of that jury, um, is there a benefit to having that diversity appearing in front of a diverse jury by way of the outside counsel? So, I mean, a, apart from just having the conversations about wanting the matching ethos, what are those consequences and or benefits? I think I've been very lucky in that the conversations that I've had with outside counsel have been fruitful. And, um, and responsive. I will also say, some of you know that I was a trial attorney um, as part of a big part of my practice before I came in house. And there is absolutely no question um, that your jury wants to be able to connect with the attorneys who are trying the cases. I always thought, particularly representing a public hospital, that being a woman in front of a jury was incredibly valuable. Um, so I think that. I've been lucky that I haven't had to enact any consequences, but I do think that um, to the extent that if I'm interviewing firms and they seem puzzled by a question around um, DE&I or resistant or um, Noah's Arky about the way that they are considering DE&I, then I would probably be less likely to choose them. So the, the folks who I have relationships with are, have, again, been very responsive and responsible about this. Um, and then there are those who that's been something that I've considered to be detrimental and wouldn't really add to the compliment of folks that I have supporting our team um, if they don't have that mindset. I mean, I will just tell you, Brent Henry. Um, who I met uh, five years ago or six years ago, who has retired and now is with a Boston firm. I've established a relationship with his firm simply because I know that with regard to DE&I issues, he and I are on all fours and that he reflects in his ways the ethos of my organization. One, one more question, Dr. Stewart, you mentioned uh, the paper that you had published. Um, where can we find that paper? Uh, if, if, if that's something we can make available for our bar members to, to, to view. I'll, I'll send you a copy that you can distribute. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Jay, I think that's, uh, that's, that's good on questions as we're running a little over one o'clock as well. We are. I, I, I thank everybody and I'll turn it back over to Ilias for his final closing remarks. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, thank you to our wonderful panel. That was a, uh, that was a deep discussion and, and I've been uh, chatting with a few people. Everyone's very appreciative of just how informative this discussion was. Um, I think from, from the perspective of our diversity council, our diversity and inclusion council, uh, in a smaller community that's working so hard to get more diverse. These voices that we just heard today, these perspectives that we just heard today were uh, very important for us to understand how to move this needle forward. Uh, and in a, um, I think in a, in, in a discussion we haven't really had before about how it impacts outside counsel. Um, so 
it's a, a multifactorial issue. Um, and I appreciate these perspectives we had today. Uh, I thank everybody who joined on the call to listen to this discussion. Uh, we'll continue to have these town halls. We'll continue to have these discussions. Uh, Carol Ann, uh, Dr. Stewart, uh, Ms. Lindsay, thank you so much for being part of this. We hope you'll continue to be involved with our Bar Association. And again, thank you to everybody who joined today. And we look forward to uh, continued efforts for diversity inclusion in the Sarasota County Bar. Thank you.